Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is The Rain Ghost. While I was there, it rained every day. Every morning would dawn bright and clear with the azure ocean stretching into infinity from the hotel window, looking like the sun would shine forever. Then, sometime in the late morning or early afternoon, a quick curtain of clouds would blow in from the ocean. A brief torrential rain would fall as the clouds blew over, the last drops shimmering in the sun as they fell from a clear sky. If I hadn't been there in the monsoon season, it wouldn't have rained every day like that, but I didn't care. In fact, I kind of enjoyed it. It seemed less lonely than the sunlight. I missed him less acutely in the rain. After a couple of weeks, I knew the routine, and I would dazzle the other guests, newlyweds mostly, by sniffing the air, maybe licking a finger and letting the breeze caress it, and announcing, It'll rain today. And it always did. Some days it rained twice, so if I was feeling lucky, I would predict two rains. If it rained only once, I would avoid that particular couple. But if the rain did fall twice that day, I'd make sure they ran into me in the hotel bar so that they could marvel at my ability. The hotel was at the edge of town with all the rest of the hotels, and at the edge of the sea since the town crowded right up to the ocean. Along the edge of the sea ran a wooden walkway that rang and sucked with the pounding of the waves, and teamed with tiny crabs who'd crawled across the shining beach the hotel shared with the jealous sea. In the afternoons I'd make my way across the beach, that white field of sand covered with basking, baking young couples rubbing oil on hairless backs and pre-child bellies. I'd move slowly, of course, aware of the eyes following me as I progressed. I never acknowledged the stairs because that would have diffused the mystery, and I was, of course, the woman of mystery on that beach. It was another of my small amusements. At the far end of the beach, the natural rocks of the island came right down to the water in an arm, a thick jagged limb of jumbled rocks that created a closure to the beach and hid whatever was on the other side. Since I couldn't swim, I had become a collector, shells, husks, flotsam, and it occurred to me that those pickings might not be so lean among those rocks. So one day I had mounted them and discovered a new land on the other side. It was another tiny crescent of beach, this one wholly surrounded by outcrops, and backed by the dense palm jungle that covered so much of the island. In some other season it might have been as densely covered by people as the other was, but in monsoon season it was always empty except for Tony's lunchbox, an open-ended shed set just in front of the first line of arching palms halfway down the beach. And unlike the hotel side, no cars. Not a single automobile in sight. Just the sand, the surf, and Tony. Maybe Tony did a big lunch business. I don't know. By the time I got there, it was always early afternoon, and no one else was there. He was just sitting on his stool, cracking crabs and filleting dolphin fish, humming to himself. Tony sold hot dogs and hamburgers of questionable pedigree, since the island was too small to support anything bigger than a few emaciated goats. In addition, he sold battered chunks of deep-fried dolphin fish and crab cakes. The dolphin fish was good, but it was the crab cakes that transcended earthly delight. He'd mound the thin flakes of crab meat on his wooden cutting board and fold them into puddles of his secret batter, shaping them into plump patties by hand and lowering them into the sizzling oil and wire baskets. They were not of this earth. I'd clamber over the rocks that would have been difficult to surmount even without my disadvantage and make my way down the lee side with painful slowness. He'd see me coming and drop a basket of half-cooked crab cakes into the oil. They were still good, but not quite as good as the fresh ones I could have if he didn't see me coming. He always kept a few half-done ones on hand, and often as not, that's what he'd have ready for me when I made it across the strip of sand to one of his molting, sun-bleached, leatherette stools. Any day now, I'd tell him. I'll be able to get here so fast you won't be able to pawn those half-cooked hockey pucks off on me. You're much faster already, he'd say. Faster than yesterday. Any day now and you'll be going home. I'm not going home, I told him. I am home. He'd shake his great fifty-pound head and wink one huge eyelid. Any day now, and you'll be going home. But I was there to stay. Of that I was sure. Every day I crept over the rocks at the end of the beach, and made my way in the soft sand to his stand, and he'd compliment my progress. 
There'd be no one else on the beach, and I'd wonder how he stayed in business. One day when I got to his stand, I could feel the rain coming in. The clouds appeared over the calm sea and blew over the island, and I knew we'd have rain in a few minutes. I sat on a decaying stool and leaned my foolish little four-footed cane against the bare plywood below the counter and waited for the rain to come. Tony's lunchbox, like every other outdoor concession stand on the island, had a long awning woven from dead palm fronds, deep enough for a group of people to gather to protect themselves from the short blast of monsoon rain. As the first drops punched tiny divots into the sand, something unusual happened. A woman ran up, ducking under the awning for shelter. She was completely out of breath, like she'd sprinted half the length of the beach. I just about fell off my stool. It was doubly unusual because she was both female and alone, a very unlikely combination on the island. Her starkly freckled face and chest showed that she had not been on the island long. The rain had caught her unprepared. As the downpour increased, she stood in the tiny apron of dryness under the awning and tried to catch her breath. Her nervous eyes darted away from the mammoth form of Tony and lit on me, sitting there with a fresh drink in my hand. She recognized me from the hotel, and relief flitted across her face. I'll never get used to this rain, she said. I nodded, smiling tightly. I didn't need anybody else on this beach with me, and certainly not her. She had the room across the hall, and her lover and she must have spent every single day frolicking in the sea because it was a perpetual trail of soggy footprints up to her door, and a kind of unpleasant wetness to the door itself. I could imagine the two of them stopping there, leaning against the door and doing, you know, what lovers do. The manager came up to talk with them about the soggy little path they were beating in the hallway, and with my door closed I heard her voice rising, indignantly, fearfully, plaintively. And it was in listening through my door to that conversation I learned that she was not with a man at all, but alone. She accused the manager of trying to frighten her, of hiring unscrupulous help. Sometime later, she'd stop me in the hotel's tiny lobby, putting her hand lightly on my arm. Excuse me, she'd said. Do you know what time it is? Early afternoon, I said to her. I don't know any more than that, because last week I threw my watch into the ocean. She tittered nervously, thinking it was a joke she didn't understand. You're across the hall from me, aren't you, she said, feigning sudden recognition. Yes. She'd asked me if I noticed anybody outside her door when she wasn't there. No, I told her. Anything else, she asked. What do you mean, anything else? Oh, I don't know, just anything. Have you noticed anything strange in the hotel? I'm the only strange thing here, I told her. Now, here she was, ruining my fun again. She ordered a hamburger, Bad choice, as I've said, but I saw no reason to enlighten her. I didn't care much about anybody in those days on the island. Tony tossed one of those nondescript chunks of meat onto the griddle and asked her if she wanted a drink. A beer, she said. Poor choice, I told her, finally moved to save her. The beer comes from Wisconsin and it's five dollars a can. One can, five dollars, two cans, ten dollars, and so on. I jingled the ice in my drink. Rum, on the other hand, is a little less by the gallon than gasoline is in the States. She giggled back. I, of course, had backed myself into bad memories again and fell silent. I think I'll stick with beer, she said, and she looked over her shoulder as she said that and shivered. Maybe she'd gotten more soaked than I thought. I looked, too. The rain was falling now, in a great gray sheet that obliterated the line between sea and shore, and I saw that she wasn't alone. In the downpour, another figure was coming up from the direction she'd come, still quite distant, but approaching. Her non-existent lover, perhaps. I looked hard. There seemed something familiar about the figure. Tony gave her a beer, even cracked it open for her, the gentleman. Thank you. She took a deep drink and looked over her shoulder again. I looked and he was still there, a little closer, nearly hidden by the curtain of rain. Or maybe not. The wind shifted slightly and there didn't appear to be anyone there at all. Do you know of any legends about the island? she asked Tony. Legends? he frowned. No legends, I don't think. What kind of legends? Well, she said, spinning her beer on a wet cardboard coaster, like ghosts. Any ghosts? 
Ghosts? Tony was frowning again. I suppose there's ghosts everywhere, but I don't know any specific stories. Do you have any ghosts where you come from? No, I live in a city. Really, you don't know of any ghosts? What kind of ghosts? I don't know. What about haunted houses? Ghost ships? Nothing at all? I don't think so, said Tony. She looked back over her shoulder again with something like real panic. I looked. And maybe there was somebody out there. Maybe there wasn't. You got trouble with a man? Tony asked her. Is there a man out there bothering you? You see him? She asked. Do you see anyone? I... No, said Tony. I thought I saw somebody out there, but there isn't. It's just the rain. If there's a man bothering you, you should go to the police, ma'am. They might be different than where you come from, but they still do their job. It occurred to me at that moment that there are two kinds of women, those who have lost a man and those who are trying to lose one. She stared out at the gray-veiled beach and the invisible, endless ocean beyond it, and her lip trembled. It softened me for some reason. Tony's right, I told her. If you're afraid of someone, you should go to the police. The police can't help me, she said. God, and I think I came here thinking I'd meet somebody. I find out everybody here is paired off, and now this. Just tell me. Do you see anyone out there? Of course we look, just to be polite. I don't know. I've heard of the power of suggestion. Maybe it was a trick of the rain and the wind. Maybe it was a flock of birds pushing against the headwind low to the ground. Whatever, it seemed to be closer. And if you let your imagination run away with you, through the rain you could see arms, legs, and head. And with a little more imagination, you could see that the head wasn't whole, but torn open by some horrible catastrophe. And the face was not a face at all anymore, but a great black hollow that the rain blew into and disappeared. I don't see anything, I told her. It's your eyes playing tricks, said Tony. He had pulled some crabs from the steamer and was breaking them open with hands grown impervious to the heat. His eyes kept flicking to the sand beyond the shelter of his stand. Man or shadow, the thing was closer still, nearly hidden by the veil of rain. In a matter of moments it was within feet of us, and I still couldn't tell whether it was real or a product of my understandably morbid imagination. The woman's eyes were locked onto the blighted shadow of rain and wind. Her foolishness had infected me, and when I looked, I could see him, recognize him. However could I forget that walk, the swing of those hands, that ruined face staring up at me sightless from the driver's seat in the glittering snowfall of shattered windshield glass. I hated her for having brought this upon me, for having reminded me. Go out to him, why don't you? I snarled. What? She almost shrieked it, watching the vague figure as it moved out of sight around the side of the shed. If you think there's somebody out there, why don't you just go out and confront him? Here now, said Tony. Enough of the rain. Get something in your stomach. He laid a greasy gray hamburger in front of her as the best golden crab cakes in the universe sang in the oil behind him. It was the kind of ignorance that made you hate tourists. A moment later there was a wet slapping at the back of the stand. What's that? asked the woman. Leaves, probably, said Tony. Just wet leaves on the wood. Palm leaves, I said. Wind. The noise was slow, deliberate. A wet knocking that traveled to the end of the wall and then back again. It doesn't sound like leaves, she said. Listen, it's moving. It always does that, said Tony. Leaves blowing in the wind. Nothing to worry about. That's when the force of the knocking got harder. It was deliberate now, a slow, steady knocking that ran on the thin plywood and set the stacked dishes on the back shelf chattering. Don't tell me that's leaves, she said. Do something. Branches, said Tony, but his eyes were unaccountably big. Some wind we're getting. Then came the pounding. Each blow shook the entire structure. The oil rippled in the fryers. The thin bleached boards at the back of the shed bent in with each contact. One board cracked with a sharp, dry sound. What do we do? cried the woman. Her eyes were wild. Tell it to go away. Go away, I screamed, astounding myself. Go away, damn you. Calm down, shouted Tony. It's the tree, the palm tree, right behind us. I should have cut it down years ago. 
And as he said that, I could hear it. Hear the wet smack of the trunk, the brush of the palm fronds. Yes, that was it. Look, said Tony, the rain's slacking off already. It was. Already the curtain of rain was lifting and the ocean was visible again. The woman peered past the awning. Pounding had stopped abruptly. When the rain goes, it's like a faucet shutting off. In three minutes there was nothing but wispy remnants of clouds and the hot, wet smell of everything drying off in the tropical sun. The woman finished her hamburger quickly and got up, leaving half her beer. Thank you, she said. I should be getting back. Tony and I watched her walk toward the pile of rocks at the end of the beach. That's a lady with troubles, said Tony. We've all got troubles, I told him. That's true, he said. We don't any of us need anybody else's. Right. Whatever problem she's got, she has to work out for herself. I wish her good luck, said Tony. You better cut down that tree, I told him, before you frighten away any more customers. Aye, said Tony watching the woman's shape get smaller as she receded down the beach in the direction of the hotel. She was almost to the rock pile, nothing but a tiny speck against the white sand. I was thinking of heading back myself, when I saw that Tony had just pulled the fresh crab cakes from the fryer basket. I settled myself back down on the stool and ordered another drink. Anyway, it was starting to rain again. The End